are fans of football, basketball, baseball, any of the major sports. I hate it. A few of you? I hate it. That's the second lie I've heard today. Oh, sorry. Uh -oh. Outright. Outright. So as good devoted sports fans, revenge is sweet, right? Didn't get much of a response. That's true. A little bit of a trick question, isn't it? If I asked it differently and said, uh, in a different context, instead of in sports, if I said, how many of you remember some point in time in your life when you said, that, that's just not right, that's not fair? Well, if I have an opportunity to change it, I'm going to straighten that out, right? It's a little bit related to the idea of revenge. If you've ever been in a situation where you feel like a wrong has occurred, you want to get it right, you want to get back at it, you want to change it, whatever the situation is. We're going to talk a little bit about that this morning uh, through a, a story in large part that's familiar to you, but maybe this part of it is not. So I'm going to read it to you, and then, then we're going to talk a little bit more about it. Before we do, pray with me, will you? Lord, we are grateful to be able to study your word, to get to know you better. We're grateful, Lord, to be able to hear from you, and that's what we ask this morning. We pray, God, that you will speak to us through this message, that you will open up our hearts and minds, and that you will pour into us, Lord, that we might not only have a better life to live, but we might have something to pour into others for their benefit, too. Thank you, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. I am in the book of 2 Samuel this morning, if you want to follow along. I don't have it for you on the screens yet. I'm working toward that. I know we have done that. Church 180 has done that in the past, and I hope to do that in the near future. I appreciate your patience as I'm still uh, acclimating to, to things a little, done a little differently than I have done them in the past. Anyway, we're looking at 2 Samuel this morning, and I'm in chapter 9. One day, David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? He summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba, the king asked? Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Now right off the bat, you think, hey, this is, this is going well. This is a good thing. This is a king, and he's wanting to show kindness to this particular family. If you don't know much about the story, it would seem just that way. Now, if you know a little bit about the story, you might be thinking, hmm, this is not exactly the way I would expect things to be. So let me say a little bit more to you about that. If you know the larger story, you know that, that Israel had wanted a king of their own. They had been surrounded by countries that had their own kings. They had been involved in, in all sorts of, of challenges and difficulties because frankly, as they were becoming a people, they were moving into land that wasn't their own. And so the people whose land they were moving into weren't happy about it. And they felt threatened. They felt less than. And even though God had promised to be their king, they began to say, we want our own king. I want our own human king. One thing led to another, and the prophet Samuel, who had been kind of the, the leader of the group of, of Israelites, realizing what they were asking, realizing that this was probably an offense to God, went to the Lord and said, what do I do about this? And the Lord said, give them what they want. So they went through a process which led to anointing Saul to be the king of Israel. Now Saul was a great big guy. He had all of the tra uh, traits that you would expect a leader to have. And he became king and the Israelites were thrilled. But over time, Saul became susceptible. He kind of got tripped up like a lot of leaders do. And he began to do things that were more oriented toward his good and not exactly what he was supposed to do as God's leader. And so you found, we, we find, as you read the larger story, 
that this leader anointed by God went a different direction. And eventually God had, had to make a change. And that's when King David came into the picture. So I'm taking a very long, very important story, and I'm really shortening it just for summary this morning for you. We'll talk more about this uh, in other times. But for this morning, the important thing I want you to hold on to in terms of background is that you've got a situation where one king, Saul, and his ruling family has gone out of power. As a matter of fact, not just out of power, King Saul and his son, Jonathan, were killed in battle. As a part of that coming out of power, losing their place of prominence, David is put into prominence. David takes over as king. And you have a situation where you're changing from one family to the other. And I don't know what you know about those kind of situations in, in history. But typically, especially in, in places where you would have a real kingdom, when one king replaces another, it's not out of a vote like we do. It's not a democratic situation. And when one king replaces another, usually that king does not have any interest whatsoever in having a rival. So they take out their opposition, which is a different way of saying they usually eliminate the family of the previous king. This is some of what happens and in this particular case where a war had been involved and the previous king and his son had been killed, David finds himself now in the ruling party. All of his enemies have been subdued under him. He is really at a place that anybody would want to be as a king. He is ruling without any unrest. He's in a great place of peace. And then we enter into this passage. And for some reason, David is, is talking about, is there anybody left from his family that I can show kindness? And I started this whole conversation off this morning, this sermon, by asking you, isn't revenge sweet? If you were to read the rest of this story, you would know that David had suffered a lot. This was not just a switching of the guard and then taking out your rivals. David had suffered a lot under King Saul. He had remained as faithful as he could, but when I say suffered a lot, Saul at one point tried to kill David. So we're not talking about easygoing friends. We're not talking about an easy transition. Not at all what you would expect the new king to turn and say, is there anybody left in that family that I can show kindness to? But that's what's happening here. Now one other bit of background information that may be helpful to you. He says whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake. Jonathan was King Saul's son. He was a particular son that David had become very close to. They were friends. They were the kind of friends that you would say would be closer than a brother, closer than a, a close family member. They had sworn to look out for each other. They had, in fact, entered into a covenant that they would always look out for each other's benefit. And David had made a promise to Jonathan that he would take care of his family. So he is now in a position, without rivals, without continuing war, now he's asking, is there anyone left in this family that I can show kindness to? So we pick back up. In verse 3, the king asked, is anyone still alive? If so, I want to show them kindness. And Ziba replied, Ziba being the servant, Yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Why would that be important to know? Why would he bother telling the king with all power that this man has crippled feet? How much of a rival do you think he can be with crippled feet? In a day and age when we don't have all the advanced technological warfare we have today, you couldn't get around on your feet, you weren't much of a threat. So he's telling the king, yes, there's somebody left in the family, but they're no threat to you. Where is it, the king asked, in Lodabar, as Eva told him, at the home of Mechir, son of Amiel. So David sent for him and brought him 
to Mithra's home. His name was Mephibosheth, excuse me. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. You would do that, wouldn't you, if you were in your rival's house? Greetings. That's the way David greeted him. Greetings. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. And David said, don't be afraid. I intend to show you kindness because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat with me here at the king's table. Can you imagine the shock? I mean, you're coming into this, this palace being summoned, and even though you've got crippled feet, you've been hiding out. I mean, you're part of the family that usually would be taken out. You're not wanting attention called to yourself. And when this new king summons you and has you come, the last thing you're expecting is a blessing. Let alone this kind of a blessing. He's basically saying, I'm going to give you everything back that your father's family lost. I'm going to provide you a tremendous amount of land, so much so that he goes on to say, I've given your master's, he tells the, the uh, servant, Siva, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him. He's given him so much property back, he's got to have a lot of help just to farm it. Think about this. Think if you had a rival. Think if you had someone maybe that, that you had been back and forth with and you always felt you always felt like there was a there was a time that would come when you were going to be in a place of of need and you had to hide out because the one who had the power to do anything about it frankly might be looking for your head imagine being in his in his situation it's not an issue of is there an opportunity for revenge for Mephibosheth. There's no way that's, a, that's even not. He's hiding. Please don't take me out. And he enters in and the king blesses him and he blesses him so much that he's going to have to have a tremendous amount of servants to help him with this. Ziba as a servant, obviously, says, Yes, I will. Yes, my Lord, I'm your servant, and I'll do all that you've commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table. David just put one blessing on top of another. He said, I'm not only going to give you all of this land, I'm not only going to have you in such a place that you have to have all these servants just taking care of them the produce from the land, but I'm also going to have you eat at my table, the table of your father's rival, for the rest of your life. Blessing on top of blessing. It's anything but revenge. It's anything but what would be expected. David has decided as, as king of the land that he would call in his rival's descendants and bless him. Now again, it's not something we would expect. As we look around today, it's not something we see very often. How many times do we follow politicians today or do we follow leaders in different countries that given the opportunity, they're going to step in and the last thing they're thinking about is blessing the one who's the place they took. Matter of fact, usually what you hear from one that places another, you hear them talk about all the things that they're going to change. All the ways in which they're going to now make things right. As a matter of fact, if anything goes wrong, a lot of times what do we do? We blame the leader that came before us. You rarely hear of looking to bless that previous leader's family. This story really spoke to me because, you know, I used to be in retailing. And we're not quite at Halloween, but I know that the time is coming very soon when we're going to be looking to Christmas. Everybody's going to be celebrating Christmas. 
And as we begin to celebrate Christmas, we, particularly those who are following Jesus, we begin to think about what Jesus came and did for us. We look for what opportunity He brought us. A renewal of life. A renewal of blessing. And we are celebrating not only what maybe lies in the life ahead of us, but we're also celebrating what opportunity we have in this life. You and I both know none of us deserve it. The Scripture is very clear in telling us. In a lot of ways, David's act in this rather strange, unexpected story prepares us for the one to come. Because just like this king, we celebrate the coming, we will celebrate the coming of a king who comes to people who don't deserve it. And instead of providing what we ought to get, instead of coming and instituting punishment, payback, revenge upon treating his father with contempt and rebellion, like we have done. Jesus comes and offers grace. When I think of it in Jesus' terms, when I think of it in religious terms, frankly, folks, sometimes it's easy to take grace for granted. Sometimes it's easy for me to think, well, of course, that's, that's what God has done for us. But when I look at it in real on-the-ground terms, and I think of being in a place where a rival has taken over and they're looking to take me and my family out. Or to put it in more contemporary terms, if I've been replaced, if I have been taken out of a job, if I have, because I, I was not lining up, with what somebody wanted me to do, even if it was the right thing to do. If I found myself in a place where there was someone else was in charge and I knew that the possibility of me suffering under revenge was real, I would be shocked to have that person come and just simply offer grace to me. Not expected. It's not something we talk about much. But it makes our faith have feet on the ground. And it's what I want to highlight to you today. Not only is it something that God does for us, He calls us to be this way. So I joke when I talk about being sports fans and, and hey, do we want to take revenge out on... Do we want to see our team take out revenge on somebody who maybe upset our team in the past? In a very real way, folks, you and I face situations like this all the time. Maybe someone has wronged us. Maybe someone has made us feel like we were treated unfairly. Maybe someone has, has put us in a place of suffering that we, we feel like we didn't deserve even though maybe we didn't do everything the right way. Maybe we didn't do all we could to support them. We find, we, we find ourselves on the out. What do we look for? What do we hope for? When you put yourself in the other shoe, you're the one now in power. You're the one that holds the opportunity to determine what someone else receives. We're called to be people of grace. We're called to exhibit the same grace that David did in, in situations unthinkable in the culture around us. So what I want you to consider this morning, and in particular this week, maybe there's somebody in your life. Maybe there's a situation at work, or at school, or in, in your community. Maybe there is some instance where to follow our leader, we ought to be offering grace even when it's not expected. Grace, even when maybe others around us would think, what's wrong with you? Nobody does that. This person wronged you. Why are you doing this? It's an opportunity in a very tangible way to demonstrate 
what our leader has done for us. And the more unexpected, the more undeserved, the more faithful our example will be. In a position of all authority, David could do whatever he wanted. In a position where he could have taken all of what he had gained from Saul's family and benefited from it. In a situation where even though Mephibosheth is, is disabled and likely not going to seriously pose a threat to him. If you read a little farther down the line, you find out that he in fact does. The human heart, our condition as people who tend to be a little self-centered, tend to get caught up in our own ways, is deceitful. And sometimes we can find ourselves, even though we maybe didn't start out this way, looking to take advantage of a situation for our own good. Friends, I want to encourage you again today. When you find yourself in a place where you least feel gracious, when you find yourself having every right according to those around you to take advantage now of your power, of your place of, of position. Remember, we're called to be different people. We're called to step out into the unexpected and offer grace. It is a defining action and it will speak far louder than any words we might offer in inviting them to follow. Lord, it's not an easy task. You know... You